Thank you for visiting experiencingliberty.com. If you ever visit the Kansas City area, stop by, we would love to meet you in person. Our prayer for you is for today's message to be a source of encouragement and hope, and quite possibly change your life. We're glad you're here. So if you've been with us uh, the first week, we talked about that there, there's, there's solidarity, solidarity in the fact that all of us uh, deal with pain. It just is, it's part of life. It's, it's part of uh, us living. And then last week, we got into kind of the question of where does it all come from? And if you remember the two aspects of, of pain in our lives, basically, if you want to look at it just from an objective standpoint, not getting into any philosophical or any theological kind of kind of ways we deal with life. The truth is, is that pain comes to us because of the free will of man and because of the nature, natural world that we live in. The free will of man saying that when I make decisions in life, I can't always choose the consequences that come alongside those choices that that I make. The other side is because of the natural way that our, our, our world functions, there are some natural causes, natural things that happen because of the way we live, because of the world we live in. And so we talked about some of that, and it kind of left us in this point of the question really then, if things happen, if things happen in our lives, where is God? I mean, if God doesn't like necessarily make us choose to do things or that he's, he's not necessarily behind all this stuff, why doesn't he intervene in some of these catastrophic things that happen? And so today, uh, we're going to get into this. And let me just say from the outset, there is no hard line answer for this, okay? There is nobody, I don't believe anyone, that is going to come to you and say specifically, this is the way it is. These are the parameters that it falls under. This is how it all kind of fits together. What I'm going to share with you today is kind of, my approach to this and how I deal with it, trying to reconcile this chaos of life alongside with this God who is supposed to be in control. So I, I want you to know just at the outset that as we get into this, it's, it, it may kind of raise some questions in you, which I think is okay, but I don't want you to just kind of back away from it. Because in order to deal with pain, I think we have to, we have to step into it. Otherwise, it gets the best of us. It is the one who is, it is the thing that is in control of us. And there's a tendency, I believe, because I've, I've been in this in, in situations in my life, that when there is pain and when we talk about pain, we have a tendency to live in a silo, to think that nobody can understand that pain that we're dealing with. Therefore, everything else around it doesn't matter because there's not an understanding of that. But I I do believe, I, I really believe that in this place right now, in this room, you would be shocked. I believe you would be shocked if you knew the pain that some of your friends and your chair and your church family members carry. Some people are more open with it. Some people are very closed with it. But there is a level of pain that permeates every one of us at some kind of level. And if you've been through this world unscathed at this point, I'm not saying just look out, I'm not saying anything like that, but you're kind of a rarity. You're kind of a rarity. Because whether it is the natural consequences of what we do, or whether it's just things out of our control, there's pain. Now, I don't want to spend, a, I want to talk about this, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on the, the, the free will side, because I think most of us get that. I think we all can understand that if we do certain things in life, then the consequence is going to follow. Simple point. If I live off credit cards my entire life, the consequence is I'm going to be broke. Then we get over here and we're like, God, why am I broke? Well, it's because you spent all your maxed out all your credit cards, and now you can't make the credit limit. I think we get that. The only point I want to make with this is that this is why the Word of God is so important, because the Word of God comes into play with our choices, 
with that natural consequences of our free will. This is why we constantly talk about following God's word because God's word leads to positive consequences. Well, will it remove everything? Well, obviously not. But this has a tendency, following God's word has a tendency to remove a lot of the garbage that we find ourselves in because we don't put ourselves under the authority of God's word. And we get to the point where we live a life apart from God's word and we find ourselves in a mess and then we come to God and we're like, God, rescue me, rescue me, rescue me. Rather than living by the methodology of scripture, we turn to the miracle of God and we think that God doesn't love us because he hasn't provided a miracle that's gonna pay off all our credit cards. So with this one, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on it because I think we get it. I think, I think we understand it. Um, I don't think anybody in here is gonna say, well, I can live my life totally apart from, from God and expect, <laughs> expect things to work out in, in some kind of way. Now again, that doesn't mean that everything works out right. And that's what we're getting to today. The other side of it. What about those things that happen in life which you don't really understand where they came from? You don't understand why they came. You don't understand how they came into your life. How do you reconcile that part with God? So that's what we're hopefully going to get into today. And I pray, for, I, I just ask you for a little grace today because it's a, it's a I mean, this is a tough topic. It's not, it's not, it's, it's hard enough to get up here and talk for 30 minutes and you guys to think what I'm, to act like I know what I'm talking about. But in a topic like this, you know, the stakes are even a little higher. And I, I don't know why that, uh, you know, I, I felt this direction, but nonetheless, here we are. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna jump into it. So up to this point, we've got to talk about pain and we talk about where it came from. Today, we're talking about then, where is God through all of this, all of this junk? And I don't think you can talk about pain in life without at least referencing or coming in contact with the book of the Bible named Job. Now, Job, many of you know, if you've been in church for any amount of time, Job is a story of incredible, incredible pain. The book of Job is found about in the middle of the Bible. It's actually a very long book, but the narrative part of it is only very short right at the beginning. And that's the part we normally know about, the narrative, where Job, at the beginning of this book, is living high on life. I mean, his life is perfect. Everything's going good. His business is going good. His relationship with God is going good. His finances are going good. And all of a sudden, there's this thing where Satan's like, hey, this guy's only liking you, God, because you're blessing him. And God's like, no, I don't think so. So in the course of events, he loses everything. I mean, a total 180. Everything that he loved, everything that he cherished, everything that he worked for is totally gone. He loses his family, he loses his possessions, and he loses his wife in the sense that they're no longer on the same page now with regards to his relationship with God. And so for the next number of, of chapters, which is numerous chapters, there are these dialogues between Job and his friends about what Job should do now. And the friends have come to the conclusion that Job must have done something wrong. I mean, for, for, for this to happen in your life, come on, come on, dude, this just doesn't happen. For you to do this, God's got something against you because you've been, a, you've been an idiot. You've been a, just a jerk, so something's happened. And so as we know, this, this story kind of takes place, and finally at the end, which we'll get to a little, a little later, everything is restored, but I don't think that's really the point of the story. Job, in this narrative is wrestling back and forth with the questions that you and I wrestle back and forth with. Even though this thing is thousands of years old, this is the same question we wrestle with time and time again. Why did everything fall apart? Why did everything fall apart? Everything was going great. Everything was perfect. And then for some unknown reason, everything is gone in just what appears to be snap of the fingers, everything's gone. And Job is left trying to pick up these pieces and trying to reconcile his life right now, the pain that he's going through, the loss that he's going through, and where the heck is God? Where the heck is God during this? 
And there's this pain that kind of flows back and forth through all of this in this argument that ensues between, between Job and his wife and his friends. Now, Harold Kushner wrote a book like 40 years ago, and he refers to the book of Job, and he comes up with these three statements about Job and about the life of Job and kind of what we think when we look at Job and his scenario that he's living. Now, let me give you these, these three scenarios or these three statements that he comes up with with regards to this. The first statement is this, God is all powerful. God is all powerful. In other words, when we look at the story of Job, that Job is living under the control of God. And there is nothing that happens in Job's life that God does not either ordain or does not control or permit or allow or control. So this is the first statement that, is, that, that we look at and we believe when it comes to not just this story, but our lives, that God is all powerful. The second statement is that God is all loving. God is loving. God has our best interests in mind. God is not out to hurt us. God is not out to create the pain in our lives. God loves us. Now we believe that, again, trying to look at the book of Job, but we also have a belief in that as, it looks, as we look at our own lives. The third statement then is that Job is relatively a good person. He's a decent man. Now he's got his flaws like everybody else, but in relation to what happened to him, is he that much worse than another person who did not get the same outcome? So in other words, yeah, we all sin, we get that. We all understand that. But if we're looking at it like, Job, you did something wrong, then everyone who does something wrong should be punished to the extent that Job is so-called punished. So we, we look at Job and we're like, there's nothing wrong with him to the extent when you compare him to another person. Now, these three statements, I think we all look at Job and we can look at them and we can think that, yeah, they're pretty true. We look at our own lives and we think, well, they gotta be true as well. That God is all powerful, God is all loving, and that, you know, we're kind of decent people. We may not be perfect, right? But in comparison to some other people who are being blessed, I mean, come on. I mean, it, it just, it doesn't mesh. Now, while the beginning of the book of Job is happening, all of these statements are true. While everything's going great, while Job is living a life that is so called perfect, we can look at these statements and we're like, yeah, absolutely. God is all powerful, blessing Job. Nothing is happening against Job because God is blessing, because God is all powerful. The second thing is, yeah, God is loving. God loves Job so much that he is giving Job all of these blessings in his life. And the third thing is true as well. Job is a good person and because of his goodness, he is not getting reprimanded for being bad. Whether you believe, whether you believe that kind of scenario or not, all of these statements can be true. But the problem comes in, in the middle of chapter one, where everything bottoms out. Everything falls apart. He no longer has his job. He no longer has his family. Everything is falling apart. The question is, is God all powerful? Is God loving? Is Job a decent man? Because in order for all three of those to be true, how does that reconcile with what's happening to Job? Well, if God is all loving, why is he putting pain upon Job? If God is all powerful, why is he allowing the pain to come to Job? And if Job is a decent man, why is all this happening? You see, what really comes into play here is the question, which of those three are you willing to give up with regards to Job's life when you cannot explain it? Because if God's all powerful and if he's all loving and Job's a decent man, then all of this garbage should not be happening to Job, right? 
So we look at our own lives and we have these three statements. Now, while things are going great, no problem. No problem at all. I mean, God is all powerful. He's giving me good stuff. God is all loving. He's blessing me. And I'm a, you know, a pretty decent person. That goes without saying. So we have these three statements that we can buy into when things are going great. But what happens when the bottom falls out? What happens when the pain comes in? Is it that God is all powerful? If he's all powerful and he's all loving, then why the pain? And if he's all loving and he's not all powerful, but then maybe I did something that caused this. So all of a sudden what we're left with is a confusion of the question, where is God in this? Which one of those are you willing to give up with regards to God and regards to yourself to make your pain fit, to make it okay, to kind of rescue God, to cover for God? What are you willing to give up? Are you willing to just say, yeah, God is all powerful, God is all loving, and I'm a pretty decent person, and all of this pain, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. Do you, do you feel that? Do you feel that God is just loving enough to cause this kind of pain in your life? You see, we get into these situations and this is what I believe is that we're taught to stand behind this thing that says, do not question God in this area. Do not have emotions about God's presence when things seem to fall apart. Just smile, just say stuff like, well, God knew, God, has a, God, God knew that something worse is gonna come down. Does that ever, ever work? Do we ever satisfy our emotional needs, our emotional confusion by just saying that somehow, you know, God is loving. He loved us so much. He loved us so much that he had to do this. I mean, do we really believe that God is, that that's the way God shows love? That God is so loving that he is going to inflict pain on you? Just because they're, they're, don't question it. Don't question it. Don't question it. Job questioned it. Job questioned it big time. And out of these three statements, here's what happened. His friends come to Job and they're, conclusion about all the problems he was facing was that Job was not a decent man. They were not going to question God's power. They were not going to question God's love. They were going to question Job's decency. And so what they did is they said, just, 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 you're, you're, something's wrong with you, man. Something, you are doing something that is causing God, who is loving and all powerful, to punish you. So somehow they believed that Job was living a life that deserved, get this, that deserved the murdering of his kids, the killing of his livelihood. That was their conclusion. How do you reconcile? Maybe you can, I can't. Maybe you can reconcile that with God being loving. I, I don't know. Maybe you can. But, but I have a struggle with that. I have a struggle just saying, hey, the reason this is happening to you is because you did something wrong. Because it doesn't wash. It just doesn't wash. Because we talked a little bit about this last week, but if a plane goes down with 200 people, if a plane crashes and kills 200 people, are they all in a situation that they deserve it? I mean, you, this, this kind of reasoning just falls apart. Yes, there are natural consequences. Yes, God uses that to get people back in line. Yes, there are wake-up calls for people. But just to say that God is arbitrarily looking down at you, waiting for you to mess up so he can destroy your life and inflict pain, does that equate with a loving God? Well, his wife said, well, I think what you should do is you should curse God. 
That was her conclusion, which leads me to believe that she doesn't think God is loving. She doesn't think that God has Job's best interests in mind. So she's willing to retract the idea that God is loving. And yeah, he's all powerful. You didn't do anything. I mean, I know you in and out. You're straight, you're a good guy. So I'm willing to give up the fact that God is loving. So she says in her mind that somehow, somehow, God, who sees the righteousness of Job and is all powerful, looks at this situation, looks at Job and is willing to let him just devote, kind of go into this place of incredible pain. Now I get that sometimes we say as parents like, well, sometimes you just have to let your kids experience, but, but come on, come on. This isn't one of those situations. This is a guy who's not done anything wrong and yet he's living in a pure hell. You don't let your kids do this, do you? You don't let your kids arbitrarily just lose everything, everything, and just step back and say, well, good luck to you. You see, we have these, these, these issues, these statements that come into play, and yet we can't reconcile them all. Now, here's what I find I do, and I think maybe, it's fine to, maybe you find it too. When I find a situation that I can't like, control and I can't reconcile, usually I fall into either number two or number three. Number two or number three. Number three, sometimes I'll fall into, well, I'm just an idiot. You know, I'm just, I'm just an idiot. I'm just a, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just a screw up. I'm just uh, all this stuff. And I go down this spiral of just self-hatred. And it's like this cauldron that I'm mixing and I'm brewing. And I'm thinking, well, God, there's no, of course, you're just, of course, uh, you know. It just, all this just craziness that comes down on me. The other thing I'll kind of step my toe into is the fact that God just doesn't love me like he loves everybody else. God doesn't love me like, I mean, he blesses, look at this person over here, look at the person he blesses over here. But me, uh, look at my life, look at them. God must love them more. And we fall into these two statements that we kind of reason for God. Either we're doing something wrong or he's not loving. I rarely, if ever, have heard anybody touch on the fact of God being all-powerful. Rarely have I heard anyone touch on this. And yet, over here, though, if you're living a life, you know, you're, you're doing your best with it, and I get you sin, but again, is your life worthy of pain? I mean, take away some of the natural stuff that happens. Is your life worthy of pain? Is God unlovable? Or does he not love us? So kind of what are we left with? All of a sudden, it kind of gets messy. It's kind of chaotic. It's kind of like, how do you, how do you make sense of all this? Well, I got I to gotta hurry up. So I'm, I'm going to get into uh, the, the continuation of Job because... In Job chapter three, we're introduced to this, this beast. It's called a Leviathan. Now you might be thinking, what is this, Jurassic Park? Or what, what are we talking about? But this Leviathan is introduced in Job chapter three. It represents chaos. It represents just overwhelming darkness. It's brought up again and a whole chapter in chapter 41 is dedicated to this creature, Leviathan. Now, I'm not talking, I'm not saying this is a legitimate creature. I'm not talking about dinosaurs or anything like that. I'm talking about the representation of what the author refers to Leviathan as. And what he refers to it as is this chaotic, chaotic creature who wreaks havoc on those who are near it, who are those who are connected with it. And in chapter 41, it starts out by saying, hey, listen, have you ever tried to pin down a Leviathan, which is this incredible, crazy, chaotic sea creature? Some of you are trying to tame this with a simple hook. And it's like, that's not going to work. And this whole chapter outlines the chaos, the chaos of this Leviathan. Finally, Job begins to realize that this Leviathan is a picture of the world and the life that we exist in. The world that we exist in is chaos. 
It is dark and it is painful. And many of us who try to figure it all out are like the person who is trying to wrangle this Leviathan, this crazy sea creature with a little fish hook. And it comes into play where all of a sudden you realize that the only one who can control this chaos is God. Because the chaos is out of our control. So moving along a little bit, I want to get into then what Job responds with. After all of this that he's dealt with, all of this idea of this Leviathan, which represents the chaos. Job says this in chapter 42. I'm just going to read it to you. It's called Job's Confession and Repentance. And it says this, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful to me which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you will make it known to me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now remember, he's not repenting because of a life of sin. He's repenting because he didn't realize God's role in this. Now he begins this repentance or this confession by saying in verse number two, I know that you can do all things. Well, all of a sudden you think, well, that means God can control everything. God is controlling, he is giving me good things and he is allowing bad things to happen. But the context of this goes back to chapter 41, the Leviathan creature. What Job is saying here is he is saying, listen, God, I now realize the big picture here. And the big picture is that life is chaos. Life is not fair. And what you can do, you can do all things, which is to take the Leviathan of life, the chaos of life, and bring it under control. In Psalms, we read how God controls it. And again, in Isaiah, you read how God controls it. See, here's what we don't want to hear. But I believe this is what the truth is, at least the way I understand it is that God is all powerful, but God has released that power to a world that is full of free will and is full of nature that causes chaos. It causes darkness. We started in Genesis chapter one, where we read how the world was full of darkness and chaos. And once the spirit of God came in, it took the chaos and it turned it into something that was good. And that is the issue which we have because God's power, God's power is not seen in the prevention of the chaos. I wish it was, but you know as well as I do, if someone comes in with a gun and shoots you, there is not going to be an intervention between God and the bullet. Nature is going to take its course. The free will of the person who pulled the trigger is going to take its course, and you are going to be left with the consequence of living in a chaotic, dark world where God comes into play now, where God comes into play as God says, listen, I am powerful enough to take the tragedy, the darkness, the chaos of what you are dealing with, and like nothing else, I can come along and I can do something with it, even though in the moment you are so filled with pain and you can't see it. Now remember, we're all in pain. We're all in pain, which leads us then to choices that we have to make. The choice is not whether or not we experience pain. Unfortunately, that is off the table. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm deeply sorry. I wish that it was easy to where we could live in a pain-free world, but we don't and we will never. But the pain that exists, the question is, what do we do with it at this point? Because God has just made himself known in the, in the context of the chaos to say he is all powerful. And Job finally realized that in spite of the chaos and darkness, that God was in control of the chaos. So we have choices to make. Let me just go through them real quick. Where is God's power seen? You have to decide. You have to decide whether or not you think God's power is going to see, be seen in the prevention 
or the comfort? Is it going to be seen in the prevention of the free will in the nature? Or is it going to be seen in the ability to take the chaos and you allowing him to do something that you can't do because you're fighting the chaos with fish hooks? And it needs something more powerful. It needs God to intervene at a place that you cannot intervene. It's a choice we have to make. Again, we don't have the choice of the chaos. The second question, the second choice we have to make is life or death, life or death. God, throughout scripture, has been characteristic of life. Life even in spite of death. Even in the midst of death, you see life. If you regress from that, if you pull away from that, the choice you're left with is a hostile, chaotic, dark world, which is characterized by nothing but pain, more pain, and more death. This is why Jesus, when he came, was all about life. This is the characteristic of God from Genesis chapter 1. I've come to take this chaotic, formless, dark life, dark world and to give it life. I have come to get you who are living in your darkness, in your sin, in your depravity, in your pain, and to give you life. That's the role of God. The question is, our choice is what do we choose at this point? Are we going to cling to God even though we hate it? Even though we don't understand it? Even though we're mad at God? Even though we're angry at God? Even though we want to turn our backs on God? Even though we want to give God everything that we have against him? The choice lies with us. But friends, all throughout scripture and our lives, God has been nothing but a relentless pursuit of giving you life, even to the point where he sacrificed his son so you could have life. The last one, where does the pain send you? Where does the pain send you? Simple question here is basically that here is God. Here is God fighting the chaos fighting the chaos. God is in this place of taking all of the chaos that is existing and fighting against it. The question is for us, at what point do we join him in the fight? At what point do we come alongside God and realize this is an unfair world? This is a world that doles out pain to the good among us and to the bad among us to the people who are blessed and to the people who are evil, that there is pain. The question is, what side are we gonna put ourselves on? We have a role in this. As a church, we have a role to step up, even as we talked about last week, stepped up to the widows, to the orphans, to the poor, to fight against the unfairness and the chaos. Are we bringing life into a chaotic world? Are we providing a sense of life? I wish I could tell you it was all fair. I wish I could just say, hey, you know, just live your life and it'll be okay. Just do what the Bible says and everything will turn out great. You and I both know that's not the deal. We know that's not the deal. But we are in a position where we are putting ourselves under the authority and under the, arch, the outstretched arm of a God who is time and time again reached out and tried to take the chaos of the world, the chaos that brought him to his crucifixion and working through that to give it life. I'm not saying that everything, I don't believe that God causes all the evil. I don't believe that God causes all the pain. I believe that God can use that pain, can transform that pain, can take that pain and do something with it. I don't know what. I don't know what, and I'm not going to pretend to just, and I'm not going to gloss over it either. I'm just going by what Job went through and by what scripture says over and over again. I want to end with a little story about a guy, a guy during the, born during the uh, turn of the century. And this guy was born, he had dreams. I mean, dreams that any person would have. Dreams of a family, dreams of a business, pretty much the kind of dreams that Job would have had. Where he would go into life and everything, you would assume, everything would work out like it, it should. Well, his name was Thomas Dorsey, and he had a wife named Nettie. And in 1932, or 1931, he found out his wife was pregnant. Again, you can imagine the dreams go high here this point. Well, in 1932, unfortunately, during the childbirth of his 
of his, of his child. Both his wife, Nettie, and his soon-to-be child died in childbirth. Everything, everything that this man longed for, everything that he dreamed about was taken in an instant. He was brought to these questions about, is God all-powerful? Is God loving? Did I do something wrong? Or is this the pain and the chaos of this Leviathan life that we are dealing in? He had the same questions that you deal with. He had the same struggles that you struggle with, even if the circumstances are different. The question of God, how do I reconcile this? Well, while mourning the loss, I mean the devastating loss, he sat at his piano and began to play a melody that expressed his personal, heartfelt longing for God's presence. For God to take the chaos of what he was dealing with and come and do something with that because he's fighting it with fish hooks and he needs God to come with something greater. So he wrote these words. He wrote, precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on and let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home. It's the hymn that Denny's playing now. It's a hymn that he wrote in the midst of his pain and his grief that nobody can reconcile. I don't care how much theology you know. I don't care how much training you have. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care. You cannot reconcile this. You cannot reconcile this. But he knew, he knew in the moment those choices he had to make and he threw himself to the articulation of this hymn that has given strength to millions. I'm gonna ask you to stand as we close and I just wanna give you a moment right now. And if you wouldn't mind just closing your eyes and uh, you know, in that moment of Job's chapter 42, where I mentioned how Job confessed. I think confession sometimes is, is taken to the fact that we think we have to confess the bad things we do, but sometimes it's just a confession of, of God in our lives, of who you are, God, where you are. And maybe today, in just the moments that we have, if you want to come up and pray up here, if you want to pray and you're, you see it, I just want to give you a moment to reflect on on your own pain, your own journey, and your own reflection of where you've placed God. I feel for me, he's my only hope. Maybe you feel differently. For me, I feel like if I turn to anything else, it's, it's just emptiness. But I just wanna give you a moment here as we kind of conclude this series and then I'll close this in prayer. Father, as we, uh, as we conclude today, I really hope that, uh, you know, that this has been um, not just a help, but inspiring to let down and let go of, of, of the pain and really just try to cling to you. I, I know, I know that that's easier said than done. And I know we live in a place that we've just been told things over and over and yet it just doesn't mesh with with our our pain but as we leave here today i i would just ask that 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 you might just make yourself real make your presence real i believe we as a church have a responsibility to be the 
the hands and feet of Christ to extend ourselves in pain of our fellow brothers and sisters. And so this morning as we leave, may we not just leave with a sense of trying to deal with our own pain, but begin to raise our eyes and look at the people who are sitting next to us and realize that their pain is as real as ours. And that we can band together and we can make a difference in in realizing that there is a God behind us who is taking that pain. And even though we don't understand it, and even though, you know, sometimes it might lead to kind of blind faith, we, we have to trust that you're taking it and you do care about us. You do love us. And I would ask that for people who are in here pain filled right now, that you might somehow lighten that, that you might alleviate some of that, bring some joy back into their lives to realize the truth of the joy that you can offer. Thank you again for this church. Thank you for who you are. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. All right, everybody, have a great week.